By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we're going to look at an old school magic match between me and one of my patrons, Peter. And Peter is a player from the Netherlands and he is bringing a red and a green aggro deck to the table. And it's really funny, the coincidence has it that I'm actually also bringing an aggro deck to this match. It is my green stompy deck. It is a budget green brew deck. So if you're interested in budget builds, this might be a cool episode for you to watch. Now, before I dive into the deck text, I would just like to point out that as always, you can choose what part of this video you want to watch when, and you can do that by uh, taking a look in the description below. There you'll find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG games. If you click on there, you go directly to the games, but there are also two other timestamps that show the specific deck text in this video. So if you want to check out the deck of Peter or my deck, you can just go there straight away. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's dive into the deck text and we're going to start with my deck, Green Stompy. And here we see my deck, Green Stompy. And um, yeah, the idea of this deck is quite simple, isn't it? I just want to play out a lot of creatures and attack, put them, turn them sideways every turn and just attack. There are a few little tricks in this deck. Uh, maybe it's nice to first point out the Pendlehaven. So Pendlehaven is a, a, a land from Legends and I can tap it to give target one, one creature plus one plus two. I think this is really insane. So what I can do, for example, I can attack with my script sprites, tap my Pendlehaven to make it a, into a two, three, then play a giant grove on it and make it into a five, six flyer, you know? So, I mean, it gets out of hand really, really quickly. You're talking about out of hand. There are a few more expensive cards in this deck. So it is, I guess it's budget when you look at old school, right? For an old school deck, this is definitely budget, but there are some expensive cards in here and uh, three of those cards are the Berserk. So Berserk is an instant and what it does, you can play it on target creature and then the power of the creature doubles and it gains trample. Now, if you've attacked with that creature in that turn that you play the Berserk, it is also destroyed at the end of the turn, okay? So you would usually just play this on your attacker and then the creature is destroyed, but that doesn't really matter because what matters is just dealing as much damage as quickly as you can, right? So let's go back to the script sprite scenario. So I've got a script sprites. I'm pumping it up with my Pendlehaven, making it into a two, three. I'm playing my giant grove on it, making it into a five, six. Then I'm playing the Berserk. That means I now have a 10, six trample flyer. I mean, that is huge. I can just deal 10 damage pretty much out of nowhere. All I need is two green mana open and of course the Pendlehaven on the board, right? And then one script sprite can do that. So if you can have one, one, one script sprite deal 10 damage, imagine what the other uh, cards in my deck can do. And um, there, there may be a few other tricks that are kind of nice to note in this deck. There's a little tempo trick in here. Um, I have, of course, my Lanawar Elf. So if I can play a Lanawar Elf turn one, then turn two, I can play an Ice Storm. And the great thing is I will be up one mana because of my Lanawar Elves and my opponent will be down a land, so down a mana because of the Ice Storm. And it's really difficult when you play against an aggro deck to kind of be behind because you're going to be under pressure from the get-go. So I think land removal and aggro really goes hand in hand. And talking about hand in hand, there's another card that worked really well with this strategy and that is Ankh of Mishra. So Ankh of Mishra is an artifact for two that reads whenever you play a land, you get two damage. So that also counts for me, but more importantly, it counts for my opponent. So I use an ice storm to get rid of one of his lands. I keep attacking with my creatures. He probably wants to play out some spells to try to stop the damage, right? But in order to do so, he needs the mana. So he's gonna play another land and that's gonna hurt him even more. So he's kind of in this catch 22 situation where whatever decision he makes, it's gonna cost him life. And that's exactly where I want my opponent to be. That's the spot where I want my opponent to be in. And um, just going back a little bit back to the budget, I think, you know, the seven expensive cards in here are the three Berserks and the four Ice Storms. But besides that, this is really an affordable deck and a deck you can start making if, you, if you're into, into old school. I guess, by the way, the Sylvan Libraries are a little bit expensive as well. I know the reprint, uh, reprint Sylvan Libraries have gone up recently also. But, you know, for old school, um, for old school circumstances, this is really a budget deck. So um, yeah, this is this is the deck, Green Stompy. I have, I don't think I can uh, I can say anything more about it. It's really straightforward. It's a lot of fun to play. I don't play aggro a lot, so I'm looking forward to kind of practice my aggro skills again. And I'm going to do that against Peter, and he is bringing his green red aggro deck to the table. Let's take a look at his deck. 
And here we see the deck of Peter. And as you can see, there are a lot of cards actually that I play in my deck that Peter is playing in his deck. And I mean, we see a full play set of Lana War Elves, we see Scavenger Folk, Argovian Pixies, of course, the Urnum Jin. It's just too good to ignore, right? And we see uh, four Giant Groves. And then we also see the Berserks. So we could get some Berserk on Berserk situations in this matchup. That's going to be kind of tricky. Uh, we also see Sylvan Library. And I guess Sylvan is like really important when you play aggro because your whole goal is to kill your opponent as fast as you can. So you're just going to use your life as a resource, right? And Sylvan allows you to trade your life for cards, which means you can find more creatures to put on the board. Or in the case of Peter's deck, find more burn. And I think this is where this matchup is going to be kind of tough for me because what does red do when you include it into your green aggro strategy? That's exactly what you can see here in the deck of Peter. It means a lot of burn, a lot of damage, four chain lightnings, four lightning bolts. I mean, that alone, that is good for 24 points of damage. He's also playing with a fork. He's playing with a disintegrate. He's playing with a fireball. All those cards are great. And also Wheel of Fortune is a great card, of course, because, you know, what if he's in a scenario where I'm on, I don't know, on six or something, and he just needs a little bit of burn to push through and just kill me, then that Wheel of Fortune can be absolutely great. And it can also be great if you simply run out of cards, because just like my deck Green Stompy, this deck is full of cheap spells. So if Pedro's just going to play this as normal, he will run out of uh, cards in no time. And then a Wheel of Fortune is just ideal. A Wheel or a Sylvan. You need a way to kind of refill your hand. Um, so yeah, this is a super aggressive deck. I really love the Kurt Apes in this deck, by the way. I think they're really cool. They don't see a lot of play because of the Mistress Factories and the City in the Bottles. But still, Kurt Ape... It, it, it's it's one of my favorite creatures. I just remember it in Revised. You would say, Taiga Kurdabe Go. And that's exactly what Peter can do in this deck. So I'm actually hoping for him to play a lot of Taiga Kurdabe Go. Although, actually, I'm saying that now, but it's really bad for my deck because Kurdabe is kind of a problem. It's a 2-3, which is pretty big. And if you just looked at my green Stompy deck, something with three toughness, I mean... That is a big problem for me, you know, and, and and of course he's also playing with factories, but factories I can ice storm, factories I can use my scavenger folk against. But Kurt Ape, that's gonna be that's gonna be tough. Um I think it's going to be a very interesting matchup, by the way. I I guess I'm playing with more creatures, so maybe I can kind of overwhelm him by just keep playing out creatures. But I mean he is playing with 16 creatures himself, and if you count the factories in with 20, so that's gonna be kind of tough for me. And he also has a lot of direct damage to finish me off. So I guess maybe, yeah, it's it's not going to be impossible for me. Um, if I can like attack his mana base in the right way, I can definitely see an, an option. But I'm not really happy to see all this burn. At least he's not playing with an Earthquake. Does he have an Earthquake in the sideboard? I don't think so. So at least that's something. Makes sense, by the way, that he's not playing with Earthquake because of all the small creatures in his deck. But I think for me, an Earthquake would be even more devastating. Anyway, this is the deck of Pater. We looked at my deck. Now let's go to the match. Game number one. Here we go. Pater on the play, starting with a Scavenger Folk turn one. Let's see. There I go. And I'm playing a Scrap Sprite so that can fly over the Scavenger Folk. And that Scavenger Folk can be very important later in the game. For example, to get rid of an Ankh of Mishra or to get rid of a Mishra's Factory. And we're kind of discussing the art, by the way. Remember this, that, I mean, he's not holding his own hand. Or she. Is, 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 it, a, is it a man or a woman? Anyway, I'm uh, blocking, deciding to trade here for the script Sprite. And this may seem like a bad trade, but perhaps I have an Ankh in, in hand. Also playing, oh, there is my reason probably to trade. And there is an Ice Storm. And I'm going for the Mistress Factory. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. So really trying to get rid of that factory also because I have a factory now and I kind of think that okay Peter is going to destroy the soul ring I thought maybe he's going to keep the scavenger folk around to try to prevent me from animating my mistress factory playing another factory and attacking here with the 2-2 not deciding to pump it up instead playing a lot of elves in my second main and passing turn so both of us are playing quite a lot in these first couple of turns and we see Peter here, he's not finding any red sources. So that could kind of work against him here, playing in Mishra's factory for himself. But I have that one Mishra. I've got two, so I can keep one at bay and pump it up. I'm attacking here with my 2-2, it seems, animating it with my forest. 
going for my hand again and attacking with my 2-2 two -two, and he's taking the 2 damage and I'm playing a scavenger folk. Interesting, I'm not using that mana to pump it up. That seems kind of odd because what can a colorless mana really do for me? I am a little bit surprised here. I should have pumped it up and, you know, deal that extra point of damage. There is... An Urnum Gen, so this is a bit of a problem. Of course, the Urnum has to give Forest Walk next turn to one of my creatures, but it's way too big. Can I find something against this Urnum? And I'm tapping three, playing an Ice Storm, going to get rid of the Taiga. I want to make sure that he doesn't have any access to red sources and passing turn again. So he's going to give Forest Walk to one of my creatures, to the Scavenger Folk. I think that's a good decision. And is he going to attack now? Playing another Mishra's Factory. Ooh, I kind of feel like the game is slipping away here. He's attacking with the Urnum. I'm playing a Berserk on it. means it's an 8. Oh, another Berserk taking 16 trample damage. Oh, no. I wanted to get rid of the Urnum so I could attack and put pressure on with my factories. Remember, I also have the Scavenger Folk. But this is disastrous for me, a disastrous outcome. And I'm taking 16 damage with one swing. This is horrible. If only I would have just, you know, kept my own Berserk. This is the risk you're taking. And I just don't have a lot of ways to get rid of creatures. So Berserk for me is also kind of a removal spell. But I'm getting punished big time. And I'm now on four. I mean, I was doing pretty good for myself until this point. So now I'm on four. Pater's on 16. This is going to be super tricky. Remember, Pater is playing with Chain Lightning, Lightning Bolt, Disintegrate, Fireball. So I have to keep pressure on. At the same time, I need to keep, you know, I need to keep uh, blockers open as well. Playing an Argovian Pixies, which is actually really good on this board because Pater only has the two Mishra's Factories. Let's just hope for me that he cannot find anything useful and that I can put some pressure on. He's on 16. I'm just really afraid that he finds, he's got three cards in hand, that he finds a red source and just kill, kills me on the spot. There's another Urnum. That is just horrible. That is just horrible because I want to put pressure on playing a City of Brass, taking a life, going to 15, playing a Lanor Elf and passing turn here. Oh man, this is not good. I mean, the only good thing now is that Pater's hand is empty. And I guess I'm just going to wait until he's going to get Forced Walk. By the way, my um, Scavenger Folk no longer has Force Walk, so I should actually take off that counter. The counter shows, yeah, now I'm doing it, that the Scavenger Folk is Force Walk. Passing the turn to Pater, Pater giving Force Walk again to my Scavenger Folk. I wonder, I don't think he's going to attack now. He is attacking with the 4-5. That's quite interesting. I didn't expect this to happen. I thought maybe he wants to keep it at bay, so I'm animating both of my factories, taking quite a risk. If he has a Bolt now... This could be disastrous for me, but lucky enough, he doesn't have a bolt. I guess he was bluffing, so I'm losing a factory. But more importantly for me is that Peter here is losing his Urnum Jin, and that's kind of opening the way for me here. Unfortunately, he has that Lanora Elf, or else I could just attack with the uh, with the um, Argovian Pixies. Remember, Argovian Pixies cannot be blocked by artifact creatures. But he still has that Lanawer, so I can attack with it, and then he's gonna, you know, block with the Lanawer. I'm playing another Scavenger Folk, and I'm actually not attacking with my own Scavenger, probably because I want to keep it so that I can destroy one of his factories on the spot. Remember, I'm still very, very low on life total. On the other hand, if I keep waiting, Pater is gonna draw into burn, and he's gonna kill me. I need to put pressure on this board, and I'm not very successful at doing so. I've got more creatures. But that soaring is going to make it really easy for Pater to animate both of his factories. Then again, I've got a double scavenger folk. I think I should just attack with my 2-2 factory. And if Pater animates, I can always destroy it with my scavenger folks. I'm deciding not to attack with my factory. I think that's really... I think that's a mistake. I think I should animate my Mishra's Factory here, attack with the Factory and the Argovian Pixies, perhaps, if I have a combat trick in hand. He's not blocking here. And I'm playing another Argovian Pixies. Okay, so I guess I wanted just to put more pressure on the board, but 
At least I've dealt some damage. He's on 13. I'm playing more threats on the table. I mean... Bather must be getting nervous. Looks like he hasn't found his burn spell passing turn here. I mean, I'm, I'm on four. At least I can take one bolt. Attacking here. Again, not attacking with the factory. It looks like he's going to attack with one Lanawer. And, okay, there's a giant growth. Interesting. Choosing to keep my Argovian Pixies alive just because of the double factory there. I think the Pixies are quite valuable in this scenario. He's on 11. There's an Urnum. Wow. This is so interesting. Finding his third Urnum of the game. And I wonder what I'm going to do here. I mean, I can attack and keep pressure on, but at the same time, I need to make sure I've got enough blockers. I don't really want to lose my Argovian Pixies. Man, and now I'm really missing that giant growth. If I would have just said, you know what, Pixies, Lana, or Elf, it's not ideal. Take it, you know, and, and keep the giant growth. At least one of my creatures is getting forced walk again. Looks like Peter just found a land. He's going to attack with his 4-5. So what I could do here is animate my factory and then also block on factory and Argovian Pixies. I mean, Peter is taking quite a risk. He knows that I have to block because I'm on 4. So I'm going to double block. Hopefully he doesn't have anything. On the other hand, if he, lo if he uses uh, a burn spell here on one of my creatures, I actually don't mind. Ooh, there's a chain lightning. Going to go to 1. Oh, man. I really, I mean, Peter's hand's empty again, I think, but I really need to step up this game. I'm not, I don't have more time anymore. Remember, Peter's playing with four chains, four bolts. What am I going to do here? Okay, I'm going to tap three, going to tap four. Do I have an Urnum Gen of my own? Looks like I'm changing my mind. What I could do here, of course, is attack with both my creatures. Because if he animates, I can just use my Scavenger Folk. Instead, I'm going to attack with Argovian Pixies and the Scavenger Folk with Forest Walk. So he cannot block that one. He's going to take the damage. Going to go down to 8. Playing an Urnum. This is not too bad. If he attacks with both factories, I'm just going to block one on the Urnum and one on the Scavenger Folk. Crossing... Oh, Fireball! Okay, I was... <laughs> Sorry, that was kind of late. He top decked the Fireball. That's it. That's it. Yeah, you know, when I was on four, after a double berserk on the Urnum, I knew I was playing with Borrow Time. And actually, Peter, you gave me a lot of time, but I just couldn't push through. I mean, it was too tricky. Anyway, we still have more games to come. So hopefully in game number two, I'll be more... Uh, the luck is a little bit more on my side. And just a note, a mental note, don't play a berserk anymore on his creatures. Because you're going to get punished. Game number two. Here we go. Starting off with a soul ring. So that's a good start for me. At least I'm on the play. Which is really important when you play aggro. So hopefully next turn I can find a green source or something. Let's see. Hammerheim into a Curdape. So the Curdape is still pretty small now. Let's see what I can do. Okay. And ooh, tapping four. This is a great start for me. Urnum Jin. This is fantastic. I couldn't find my Urnums, by the way, in game one. Where were my Urnums? I had to face three Urnums of Pater. Where were mine? Anyway, oh, look at that Taiga attacking here. Two, three. Very cheeky. Playing a giant grove, dealing five damage. That's the reason why I didn't want to block. Didn't want to sacrifice my Urnum. And I kind of like this aggressiveness of Pater. I think it's a good decision. Remember, he's got all that burn. So just, you know... Five damage is already a quarter of my life gone. It's not too bad. I'm expecting an Ice Storm here, by the way. Uh, on the Taiga, I guess, because then the Kurde becomes a small 1-1 one -one again. So taking care of that and then attacking for 4. So he's going to drop to 16. Pass turn, probably. Yep. Not attacking with the Factory. That is kind of odd. Why am I not? I could have dealt 2 extra damage. And this is really funny, by the way. Pendlehaven, of course, is not a 4, so the Curdave doesn't get the bonus. It doesn't become a 2-3, but of course, he can tap Pendlehaven to make it into a 2-3. I've always found it kind of funny. Um, but yeah, it, it, it kind of feels like I missed 2 points of damage, which is pretty a pretty big deal with these decks. Or maybe I just want to keep my factory like open to block the Curdave. I guess I guess that's an argument. I can anim yeah, so maybe I was maybe I had that in mind. So he's gonna attack. I'm just probably just gonna block now. And you know, if he has a giant growth, he's, he has a giant growth. I mean, I kept it untapped for a reason, right? So I'm gonna make it a two-two, tap it to animate it. Yeah, there we see a bolt. 
And I guess maybe now I'm asking, are you bolting? Yeah, so he's of course bolting before I declare blockers, which makes absolute sense. So I animate it into 2-2 in response, he bolts it and he deals the damage. So I'm now on 13. At least it's not a bolt to the face. And looking at my hand again, playing a forest. And I'm attacking, of course. Putting a giant growth on there, a berserk on there. Okay, this is 14 damage. Oh, and a hurricane, that's 16 damage. Woohoo! This is what my deck wants to do. Bam! You know, out of nowhere. And actually, this really resembles the 16 damage that Peter dealt to me in game one. Although there was one of my berserks involved in that. But this is exactly what my deck wants to do. And uh, I'm, I'm really, as you can hear on my voice, I'm, I'm really happy when the deck does what it's supposed to do. That, that counts for any deck that I play. When, when a plan comes together, I love it. I just love it. Anyway, this was game number two. That means it is a 1-1. One, one. So, Peter, we are going to match number three. We're going to battle this out. Game number three. Here we go. 1-1. One, one. What a thriller of a match. There's a Kurt Ape by Peter. And, of course, now Peter... Uh, you know, he's in the driver's seat being on the play here. I think it's a huge advantage. And I'm playing a script sprites, hoping that Peter doesn't find a forest because then that Kurde becomes a 2-3. So we'll just have to wait and see. Looks like he's checking something. Okay, he's drawing his card for turn. Will there be a forest? Because then the Kurde becomes a 2-3 and that's already a problem. Yep, there's the forest, so there's a 2-3. I'm expecting an attack here. Gonna go to 18, probably. There's the attack. Yep, going to 18. Let's see if we can put anything else on the board. And there is a script sprites. And sorry, an Argovian Pixies, of course, and passing turn. I'm the one with the script sprites. This is actually pretty good, the factory. You know, it, it, it's still a summoning sickness for now, but as soon as it doesn't, it's a great blocker against that Kurt Ape. I wonder, I don't think I'm gonna attack because if I attack, I'm allowing Peter to deal four damage next turn. Also attacking with the Argovian Pixies, uh, with the, um, yeah, the Argovian Pixies. Ooh, this is kind of risky, playing an Ang of Mishra. The reason I'm saying it's risky is because it also works against me. Interesting choice here. It looks like I'm missing a land drop as well. So maybe I just didn't have any better options in hand. And I kind of, I know that I cannot use the Mishra's Factory yet because it's still a summoning sickness. So I wanted to use that mana to cast something. And okay, oh, a bolt on the script sprites. This is bad news, gonna take four, gonna drop to 14. Okay, so he's gonna play a land. It means he's gonna drop to 18, but it's a factory. It's more pressure on the board. This is really bad. I'm gonna go to 12 because of my own forest. Is this Ang gonna backfire? Tapping for green. Okay, playing his Crypt Sprites. At least, again, I can use the Sprites to block the Pixies. And now I can use my Factory to block the Kurt Ape. Okay, I'm making a different decision. Choosing to play the Argovian Pixies. And of course, that's really gonna help me block that Mishra's Factory. And I'm kind of expecting Peter here to attack just with the Kurt Ape. Unless, of course, he's got a combat trick in hand. Remember, he also plays with Giant Groves and with Berserks. This is going to be an interesting combat step. I mean, animating the factory, I don't think it's really useful because I can just block it with the Argovian Pixies. But attacking with the Kurt Ape and possibly the Pixies. Actually, I would attack with the Pixies. Why not? Because I don't have my factory, right? Oh, well, factory doesn't work anyway. But then again, does he want to trade the Pixies for... A script sprite. That's, of course, an interesting question. Does he want to do that? He also he looks like he's got four cards in hand. So, I mean, if he has a giant growth or a bolt or something, a bolt would be great right now for Peter, by the way. Yeah, just attacking with the Kurt A, but two, three creature, that's a bit of a problem for me. I'm tapped out anyway. I'm probably going to take this damage. going to go to 10. Now, remember that Ang of Mishra... That is just really going to work against me. So, taking the damage, going to go down to 10. Ooh, even more creatures on the board. Looks like I wanted to take my turn, but Peter's not finished yet. yet. We're still in his second main. Okay, now he's passing turn. Going to untap here. Tap for green. Wonder what I'm going to do. I'm going to cast a Lanawer Elf. 
Lennar Elf is pretty good with that Ankh on the board. I guess I can attack him for one, right? Do I want to? Maybe I don't. Maybe I just want to keep my script sprites to possibly trade it for the Argovian Pixies if he decides to attack with it. I'm on 10. Pater's still on 18. He's really high up. And I think that's actually in his advantage. The longer this game takes, the more chances he has of finding burn and kind of burning me out. Another Mishra's Factory taking two from the end. Going to drop down to 16. We're kind of in a standstill here. And that Argovian Pixies is so important. But, I mean, another Factory is just another body. And at a certain point, you know, his army will become too big. Hopefully I can find like an Ice Storm. And then if I do, I wonder what I'm going to play it on. Because I could also play it on the Forest that will take care of that Kurt Ape. Looks like I'm going to, ooh, cast an Urnum here. Urnum Jin would be huge on this board. Okay, Urnum Jin, 4-5 Powerhouse. That is really a big problem for my opponent. On the other hand, I have to start giving away forest walks as well. I don't want to do that. Not attacking with the script sprites. I think maybe I should have attacked here with the sprites. I'm not quite sure. Playing it safe, which is kind of understandable because I'm on 10. But I have to start dealing some damage to Pater as well. Especially when I'm going to start giving him forest walk, one of his creatures. Probably going to pick the Lana or else, right? But that would mean one damage. So now it's my turn. In my upkeep, I have to give Forest Walk. So I'm going to give it to the Lana or Elf. We see that counter kind of indicating that it has Forest Walk. Now I'm going to attack with my Script Sprites. Yay! Well, at least it's a point of damage. Maybe I have Giant Crows, Berserks? No, just one point. Going to drop to 15. What else can I do here? Tapping three, there's an Ice Storm. Am I going to play it on the factory? That's the question. I'm actually playing it on a forest, trying to make that Kurt Ape small. And I'm now thinking maybe it would have been better. Okay, there's a Taiga, so it doesn't really matter. But maybe it would have been better to play Ice Storm on the forest and then attack with, for example, my Urnum as well. Taking a damage from the Lanawar Elves. Going to give it Forced Walk again. and I think I should really just attack with the Urnum. Playing another Argovian Pixies. The problem now is I'm on a lower life total. And if he can get me on 6, he only needs a chain and a bolt and I'm done. Or 2 bolts or 2 chains, whatever. But just 2 of those 3 damage burn spells and I'm, I'm toast. I'm on 8 right now. I really don't want to go to 6. I feel I should just attack with the Urnum, you know. If he, if he blocks it on, 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 on two creatures to kill it, I, that's fine, you know. At least I get rid of a creature. I need to get... Exactly, that's probably my thinking. Attacking, you're also attacking with the Argovian Pixies. Not sure if that's a good decision. And I wonder, because do I have a combat trick in hand then? Because if he's going to block the Pixies on the Kurt Ape, that's going to be really bad. I wonder what he's going to do here. I'm, I'm expecting him to double block on the Urnum. Is he only blocking? So he's taking a damage and he's blocking with the Kurt Ape. And there's a Giant Grove. So, ooh, losing the Urnum and also losing the Script Sprites. I don't have a combat trick in hand. So it looks like I just made a mistake here. Not realizing the Kurt Ape was turned back into a 2-3 because of the Taiga. I think that's what happened here. So... Very sloppy magic on my part in the third deciding game. Kind of losing my Argovian Pixies for nothing. This is kind of annoying to look back on. Big, big mistake. I do understand the attack with the Urnum. I was hoping to at least trade it for one of his creatures. On a brighter note, at least he's used the Giant Grove now. So he's not going to use the Giant Grove on his Lana or else with Forest Walk. He's going to attack, going to go to 7. And, you know, I just have to keep attacking with my flyer. I think that's all I can do really at this point. So I'm going to attack him again. He's going to drop down to 11. I'm going to play Scavenger Folk. And I'm going to pass. So at least I've got enough bodies to kind of block everything. That's something. I'm on 7 though. Not on 6 at least. So I kind of 
managed to stop the damage train before I got to six. There is an Argovian Pixies. Interesting. I'm sorry, scavenger folk, I mean. Still interesting, because he can use the scavenger as soon as I animate my factory. And the factories are just... They don't play a big role in this game because of those Argovian Pixies. Again, I'm attacking. Does that mean that I've got a combat trick now? Am I making the same mistake again? Is he going to block on the Curtip? Am I just going to lose it? He can also... No, he cannot block it on the factories, of course. That's not possible. He can block it on his own Argovian Pixies. I'm expecting him to block it here on the Curtip and kind of saying, you know what, if you've got a combat trick... Oh, he's going to block it on Lanawer. That's that's a better choice. That's a better choice. Lanawer Elf or Scavenger Folk. So he's blocking it on the Lanawer Elf. That's, of course, the downside of Argovian Pixies. It only has one toughness. Putting a Berserk on here. Interesting. So dealing three more damage. I think this is a good decision run by my part. So dealing four damage in total. He's going to drop to seven. This is such an interesting third game. It's so close. And what I love about these games is it's all about the combat. We're constantly thinking what is the best decision to take. And I think combat is one of the most beautiful things about magic. And I know that a lot of decks are kind of steering away from combat. Um, just because it's so easy to kill creatures or don't take any damage or whatever. But combat is just such an interesting part of the game. And I remember this game three. It was just really, really interesting and very intense. Now we're both on seven. And he's attacking with the Pixies. Is he going to attack with the Curd Ape? Remember, Pater's got Giant Growth. Pater's got Berserks as well. So he can kind of deal a lot of damage out of nowhere. And he's got Burn to boot. So... It's difficult. I do feel kind of lucky because Pater is not really finding a lot of burn in these matches. Of course, he finished me off with a fireball in game one. And it looks like he's really in the tank here and he's just passing turn. He's not doing anything, which is good news for me. And I'll probably just attack with the script sprite to put him on six. Problem is here, there's not really anything else I can do. That Curd Ape is actually, if that Curd Ape would not be on the field, I could at least attack with my Argovian Pixies. Maybe trade it for something. Ooh, I'm going to play, okay, playing another Urnum. That is a bit risky, of course, because that means I'm going to have to give Forest Walk again, and that means I'm going to go to six, probably. So this is a risk. On the other hand, Pater is quite low, so maybe I can just attack with everything next turn. Let me say I have one, two, three, four, five, six creatures. He's got five creatures. And of course, he cannot block the script sprite, so he can just block those five creatures. So that's not going to be ideal. I do know I'm going to attack with that Urnum. I mean, I have to, right? It would be kind of silly to keep it untapped. Beta really in the tank right now. I wonder what he's got in hand. It looks like he's passing turn. So forced walk to the scavenger folk. Oh man, if he's got like a chain and a bolt in hand, I'm just gonna, oh, I'm gonna hit myself in the head. I'm exp yeah, so I'm gonna attack with these two. I was thinking about an alpha strike, but it, 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 at this board, in this board state, it's not good to do an alpha strike. So I am attacking here with the Flyers. He's going to go to five. But the question is, what is he going to do with the Urnum Gen? He's going to block the Urnum Gen. He's not going to double block and try to kill it. He's just going to block it. Play another creature. And now I just have to hope. If he's got that double burn, I'm toast. I'm done. He is going to hit me at least for one. You're going to drop to six. Does he have... Ooh, this is bad news. This is bad news. Giant Grove. Oh, and Fireball. Oh, man. I just needed one more turn to finish him off. Oh, ho, ho. Bater, look at the hand. He only had Lance. Oh, man. Bater, congratulations, man. Oh. I kind of still... Oh, man. Let me know in the comments below if you... If you feel like I made a mistake here, um, I knew I took a risk. I, I took the risk willingly. I knew the risk. 
Um, but I also knew if he cannot kill me in this turn, I have him and I can kill him. Anyway, Paterman, these are the reasons why I play Magic. Thank you so much for this very entertaining match. I absolutely loved it. And it also reminds me again that aggro against aggro can be very, very interesting because you have two decks that want to do the same thing. They want to put pressure on and at a certain point you get this combat standstill that we had where you kind of have to try to squeeze your damage in and really slowly have to try to work towards that victory and, you know, take some risk. And I think what your deck really shows is that value of burn in an aggro strategy is just so good. Anyway, thank you, Peter, for bringing your deck to the table. I had a lot of fun. And like I said in the introduction, Peter is a patron. Now, if you want to become a patron as well, it's actually quite simple. There's probably an info card popping up right now. You can click on that info card and that will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page where you can find out how you can become a patron. And uh, you know what, if you want to, you can then play against me with your deck. So if that sounds fun, check out the Timmy Talks Patreon page. Um, and actually, before we go to the end scroll where you can see all the patrons that support Timmy Talks, I would just first like to ask you to subscribe if you're not a subscriber yet uh, and to ring that bell. That really, really helps. Uh, and also like this video, leave a comment if you want to share it on your socials. These are all great ways that you can help the channel and they're absolutely free. Okay, and now without further ado, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at the fantastic, the wunderbar, the amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het dus, ik het dus, somber gezien.